In the summer of 1940, history hung in the balance. Hitler's armies had conquered Poland, Norway, Holland, and Belgium in quick succession. Next, the Nazi blitzkrieg overwhelmed France, and the British army were forced to retreat from Dunkirk. Now, Adolf Hitler stood, just as Napoleon had stood, more than 100 years before, and looked across the English Channel to the one fighting obstacle that stood between him and world domination. A tiny island, Great Britain. The preliminaries were over. It was time for the main event. July 16th, 1940. Adolf Hitler issued Directive 16, the order to prepare an invasion of Great Britain. I have decided to prepare a landing operation against England and if necessary to carry it out. The aim of this operation will be to eliminate the English homeland as a base for the prosecution of the war against Germany and if necessary to occupy it completely. Hitler spent the next six weeks planning the invasion and occupation of Britain. It was codenamed Operation Sea Lion, and Hitler knew that if the Nazis could obtain air superiority, then they could launch an invasion. During August and September, the Luftwaffe fought the Royal Air Force over southern England. But on September 15th, the Germans lost the Battle of Britain, and the invasion was cancelled. All that remained of Hitler's dream for Britain were these plans. Using these actual Nazi blueprints for the invasion and occupation of England, it is possible to construct an alternative history of life in Britain under the Nazi jackboot. In this film, we imagine what would happen if Hitler's dream had become a reality. Welcome to Hitler's Britain. Fifteenth September, 1940. Nazi Germany wins the Battle of Britain. For the last six weeks, the Luftwaffe have been dogfighting with the Royal Air Force over southern England. First, they knocked out the radar stations, airfields and factories. Next, they took on the fighters until there were no fighters left. Now, with air superiority over the English Channel, the Nazis are ready to launch Operation Sea Lion. 21st September. 10,000 German paratroopers land on the south coast of England. The Home Guard are no match for these elite troops, and the port of Dover is captured. The Nazi stormtroopers have a foothold on Britain, and they're here to stay. 22nd September. 80,000 soldiers and 4,000 panzer tanks cross the English Channel. They land in three waves on a wide front, and before the British can react, the Nazis secure a beachhead. 23rd September. The British Army launch a counter-attack, but fleeing civilians, a lack of artillery and harassment by the Luftwaffe drive them into retreat. Central London is destroyed in a massive air raid. Winston Churchill is killed by a direct hit on the war rooms. The nation mourns, whilst the advancing Germans seem unstoppable. The remnants of the British Army, along with the government, flee to Worcester to make a final stand. The royal family are evacuated to Canada. First November, German troops march into London. The last beacon of freedom is extinguished in Europe. Adolf Hitler reigns supreme. This is fiction, but it is based on hard facts. This was the precise sequence of events that was envisaged by the Germans in the summer of 1940. These are the actual handwritten plans made by Hitler and Field Marshal Walter von Brauschitz for the invasion of Britain. 
Hitler was so confident the operation would be a success that he actually named Marshal von Brauschitz as the military commander-in-chief of occupied Britain. Von Brauschitz was ordered to produce a strategy to tame the British people in the immediate aftermath of the invasion. Von Brauschitz had successfully quelled the population of Poland by ordering his troops to brutally rape, pillage and murder the Poles. But in France he adopted a more subtle strategy and his most disciplined troops were posted to Paris where they were famously polite and even kind to the French citizens. So what would life be like for the people of Britain with Marshal von Brauschitz in charge? The Channel Islands were invaded in July 1940, the only piece of British territory that was occupied by the Nazis during the war. The islands of Guernsey, Jersey, Alderney and Sark lie closer to France than Britain. The Germans saw them as a stepping stone to invading England. So on July 1st, 1940, the Nazis occupied the undefended islands. I was looking by the window and then these three German officers were coming up Midvale Road where I lived and, and disobeyed my father and I followed them, you know, me, around Rouge Bouillon, down the parade with the Senatoppers and there's all the Germans sitting there, you know, with the machine gun belts around their neck and grenades stuck in the boots, the usual old stuff. A couple of girls chatting them up, you know, and I thought, well, that's the start of the occupation. Well, we were frightened at the time, very much so. But gradually, as we saw the Germans passing along the roads, we just um, accepted them and, and had to accept them. Within a matter of days, the Germans had moved approximately 1,500 troops in. They'd occupied the post office, the town hall, the centers of communication, and had started shopping. The Channel Islanders were terrified by the German army's reputation, but their fears were unfounded. They actually took their place in shopping queues. They bought things, they paid for money. They didn't just simply go into Woolworths and clear the shelves. They actually queued up and paid. They saw things in our shops that they probably hadn't seen for years in their own country. Of course, they went mad and they're buying this and buying that. And of course, very soon there was nothing else to buy. It was a most bizarre situation. The Germans, remember, were, as far as they were concerned, in transit. This was merely a stepping stone to their invasion of Britain. The German army had been expressly ordered to behave themselves on the Channel Islands, and we know that the situation would have been the same in occupied Britain. The evidence is a document called The Guide for Troops in Occupied England, written by Field Marshal Walter von Prauschitz in July 1940. A firm and cautious attitude towards the civilian population is to be adopted. The death sentence may be imposed for acts of violence against orderly members of the population or for looting. Any private purchases by individual soldiers are to be paid for in cash. The rate of exchange will be one English pound for 9.6 Reichsmark. But this was just the beginning of Hitler's plans for Britain. November 4th, 1940. Sporadic fighting continues around the government stronghold in Worcester, but in London a strange calm reigns over the city. Marshal von Brauschitz's well-disciplined troops have spent the last two weeks clearing up the capital, and British shopkeepers are making record profits. It seems as if the Nazis are trying to charm the British into submission. But charm was just the first part of von Brauschitz's strategy. As well as his guide for troops in Britain, in July 1940, he issued the most secret directive for the military government in England. This document outlined the second part of his strategy. Behind the velvet glove lay an iron fist. Fifth November 1940. Field Marshal Walter von Brauschitz, military commander of Great Britain, orders the deportation of almost two million prisoners of war to camps on the continent. Whilst wives, mothers and children weep, the men are taken to specially prepared camps outside Paris, where they will remain as hostages for the duration of the war. Why was this going to be done? Well, I think one has to look at the situation in occupied France, which had fallen the month before. Because there, nearly two million men of roughly between those ages had been placed in prisoner of war camps in Germany. And their sort of treatment uh, could be used as a lever. Play along with us and the prisoners will receive good treatment. Don't do what we say, don't collaborate, and the prisoners will suffer.
18th November, Dr. Franz Six arrives in London. He is accompanied by the elite Einsatzkommandos England. This is the secret Nazi death squad assigned to Great Britain. Over the next two weeks, they will kill more than 2,000 people in an operation that Dr. Six has been planning for more than three months. Dr. Franz Six was typical of the sort of people that ran these um, task forces in the sense that he was a sort of ex-hack journalist who'd somehow or other, because of his politics, managed to become a professor at a good university, believing that wasn't enough for him. So he's a sort of typical demi-educated graduate, and uh, these people were utterly ruthless and without scruple. And uh, had he, judging by what his colleagues did in other countries, I mean, uh, the slightest provocation, he would have been let loose on um, parts of the British population and would have done God knows what. Dr. Franz Six had been a fervent Nazi since 1933 and had used his connections to obtain a high-ranking position at Berlin's university. Here, he used his pseudo-academic credentials to justify the Nazi policy of eliminating their enemies. Having proved his loyalty, in July 1940, Dr. Six was appointed as the higher police leader for Great Britain. His orders came directly from Reinhard Heydrich, head of the German security service. Nicknamed the Blonde Beast by the Nazis, Heydrich was the most feared man in occupied Europe, and these were his instructions. Your task is to combat all anti-German organizations, institutions and opposition groups in England. Dr. Six immediately began assembling his team. The documents he wrote have now been translated for the first time and they paint a terrifying picture of his plans for Britain. In this file he describes precisely how his elite death squad would operate. Six intended to set up his headquarters in London. The cities of Manchester, Liverpool, Birmingham and Bristol would each have their own task force. Dr. Six even assigned specialists to handle different groups such as Freemasons, Marxists, Liberals and Jews. Dr. Six spent almost a month training his team of murderers at a secret location. On August 8, 1940, he wrote this letter to Heydrich. Gruppenführer. The preparations for the Einsatzgruppe for England are complete. Classes in practical English have been given and have been rounded off with a few hours of pistol and machine gun shooting. Signed, Dr. Six. It's very interesting that, that there was um, a task force, one of the Einsatzgruppen, formed and assigned to deal with England um, because one, can, one knows what they did when they were, when similar units were followed the troops into Poland in September 1939, they did round up large numbers of people who they thought were the social elites and they murdered them. They just, you know, took them out to a forest or something and shot them down. Anticipating that his workload in Britain would be very high, Six commissioned these signs three months before Operation Sea Lion was due to take place. November 20th, Dr. Franz Six and his death squad commandeer the Dorchester Hotel. Over the coming months, Suite 513 will acquire a notorious reputation. From their new headquarters, the Einsatzkommandos begin their reign of terror. On the first day of operations, 44 prominent Londoners are dragged from their homes. Amongst them is the entertainer and playwright Noel Coward, who dies whilst being interrogated. He was number C-96 in the Nazi special search list, otherwise known as the Black Book. One of our great prize exhibits at the museum is the Black Book, the special arrest list that was produced by the security service of the SS, which lists thousands of people in this country that were going to be arrested if the Germans had successfully invaded this country. Of the 20,000 copies of this book that were originally printed, only two remain in existence. The Sunder van Dungus list, GB, or Black Book, named 2,820 individual enemies of the Reich, who were to be hunted down and eliminated once Britain had been occupied. All the members of the British government and the civil service were on the list, as well as various European emigres who had fled Nazi persecution. But the remainder were the cream of Britain's intellectual and literary elite. With Teutonic efficiency, the Nazis would have worked their way down the list 
in alphabetical order. November 22nd, 1940. Dr. Franz Six's reign of terror continues. E.M. Forster, author of A Passage to India, is arrested on charges of homosexuality and deported to Germany. Outspoken socialist and science fiction writer H.G. Wells is fatally wounded trying to escape the Gestapo. Bohemian novelist Virginia Woolf drowns herself rather than face interrogation by the Nazis. But not everyone in the Black Book would fall foul of Dr. Franz Six. Aldous Huxley, the writer of Brave New World, had fled to California in 1936. Whilst entertainer, sportsman and communist Paul Robeson was also on the list, he too would certainly have fled to the United States before the Nazis could catch him. Dr. Sigmund Freud, who fled to England to avoid Nazi persecution, had already died in 1939. Despite these inconsistencies, the Black Book remains extraordinarily accurate. So who was the cold-blooded Nazi who had so meticulously compiled and cross-referenced almost 3,000 people in such a sinister document? The death list had been assembled in the summer of 1940 by Walter Schellenberg, a rising star of German intelligence. But the Black Book was really just an appendix to Schellenberg's masterpiece, Informationsheft GB, The Nazi Guide to Britain. At the end of June 1940, I was ordered to prepare a small handbook for the invading troops and the political and administrative units that would accompany them. This task occupied a great deal of my time, involving the collection and assembly of material from various sources. Despite Schellenberg's modest description, Informations Heft GB is actually a blueprint for the ruthless domination and total exploitation of Britain. By examining this book, chapter by chapter, we gain an extraordinary insight into the Nazi designs for occupied Britain. The first chapter of Informations Heft GB analyzes the British system of government. In spite of the general right to vote, which has existed since 1918, Parliament is still linked to the class system. Walter Schellenberg went on to write a detailed analysis of the government infrastructure, from Whitehall down to local parishes. This information was essential to the Nazi strategy for the occupation of Britain. What they want to do is to work with existing structures, and we see this throughout Western Europe. Once they'd conquered places like uh, France, Holland, Belgium, uh, the Netherlands, uh, the Scandinavian countries, they, they want to work with existing political structures. Willing allies have been that shoddy crew of politicians and would-be dictators who have followed in the footsteps of Norway's despised Bidfin Quisling, the easy way to wealth and power. Even in stubborn Yugoslavia, the Germans found a Quisling, the fascist murderer Ante Pavlic, whom they tried to build into the semblance of a national leader. In Belgium, the despised fascist Leon de Grel, excommunicated by the church, has helped the Germans enslave and destroy his own countrymen. So who would the Nazis want to run the government in occupied Britain? Oswald Mosley, the leader of the British Union of Fascists, in a sense would have been um, a, an ideal figure because in addition to being a fascist, he was also very much a fully paid up member of the British upper classes. Oswald Mosley was the only homegrown fascist politician in Britain. He modeled himself on Mussolini and at the height of his popularity in the 1930s, he had more than 40,000 supporters known as Blackshirts. Despite his fascist credentials, this is not what the Nazis wanted in a puppet ruler of Britain. Very, very rarely would the Nazis actually give real power to native fascists. The Nazis were much more willing to deal with established politicians uh, who they felt would deliver the goods better. We know from the 1930s and from, from the era of appeasement that there were politicians who wanted to deal with the Nazis uh, on, on the basis that they were reasonable political people. This morning I had another talk with the German Chancellor Herr Hitler. We should ask nothing better, as we have said more than once, than to work with Germany. I think these are the people that 
that the Nazis would have been looking to, to have provided government uh, in the period after they, they'd invaded. November 22nd, armistice. The war is officially over. Since London was occupied less than two weeks ago, the British government and what's left of the army have been holding out in Worcester. But today, Lord Halifax met with Marshal von Brauschitz in the town of Leamington Spa, where they signed the armistice agreement. The Germans will retain direct control of London and the South East, while Lord Halifax will administer the rest of Britain. With a compliant government in place, the Nazis' next move would be to hold together the empire. If Britain either joins the Nazi war effort or is occupied, the main worry in Berlin must be what is going to happen to that far-flung empire. If the empire collapses, somebody else is going to seize parts of it. Somebody else is going to be America, Japan, in particular. This is a thought that obsesses Hitler. Obviously the key to holding that empire together is a figure like the Duke of Windsor. He might induce the kind of loyalty in British officials to hold it all together for the Fuhrer. Edward VIII abdicated in 1936 and became Edward Duke of Windsor whilst his brother took the throne. The official story was that his abdication allowed him to marry Wallace Simpson, an American divorcee who was unacceptable to the British establishment. But the Germans believed that the real reason he was forced to abdicate was that he and his new wife were sympathetic to the Nazis. The Germans are interested in the Duke, and the evidence of it, of course, is that they invite him to Germany and show him round the country and all the leading Nazis get to see him. There is a palpable sense of regret that he is no longer on the throne. Goebbels, in his diary, notes precisely those words, what a shame that he isn't king anymore. So it's not too difficult to see what the Nazis would have wished to happen. We can never know for sure whether the Duke of Windsor would have returned to Britain. But we do know that the Nazis were very keen to recruit him. Just before the invasion of Britain was due to take place, the Duke was on a hunting trip in Portugal. Hitler ordered his favorite intelligence officer to make contact and offer the Duke 50 million Reichsmarks to cooperate with Germany. The name of the spy was Walter Schellenberg. Within two days, I had drawn a close net of informants around the Duke's residence. Within six days, I had a full picture. The Duke of Windsor was most annoyed by the close surveillance of the British Secret Service. He did not like his appointment to Bermuda and would have much preferred to remain in Europe. Schellenberg was then ordered to kidnap the Duke if he could not be persuaded with cash. But before Schellenberg could act, the Duke of Windsor left the country to take up his appointment as governor of the Bahamas. If they had invaded and if the Duke of Windsor had been willing to join them or had been kidnapped in some fashion, then um, I think he might have been restored to the throne. I think we can picture the likely scenario. There would have been, in effect, an abdication broadcast in reverse, with Edward VIII addressing the nation. Again, it is not too difficult, the kind of speech that might have been written for him. Terrible crises, the very people who brought it about are the people who forced me out. Only way out of it now is to unite, pull through together. I know Hitler personally, have known him for years, great friend of Britain, no problem there. Let's concentrate on the future. December 1st, 1940. The King and Queen of England might be in Canada, but at least one royal is coming back to Britain. The Duke of Windsor is returning to England to become Prince Regent, and Wallace Simpson will be his princess. Whilst Marshal von Brauschitz retains Marshal Lord in London and the South East, the Duke and Duchess will rule free Britain from Balmoral in Scotland. With control of the British elite, the Nazis' next move would be to use the humble British Bobby for their own ends. A 
chapter in Informationsheft GB gave the Nazis all the operational details they needed to assume control of the British police force. It was noted by 1937 that many of London's police officers showed an interest in studying German. Criminal Investigation Division Chief Constable J. E. Horwell is an experienced and practical man who has always behaved in a pro-German manner and has always been helpful. The book includes a comprehensive breakdown of the hierarchy of the Metropolitan Police Service. Also singled out for special attention was the Central Registry of Foreigners located at Bow Street Police Station, along with the collection of fingerprints on the third floor, which contained files on more than half a million people. The reason they were so interested in the police is a question of manpower, that their own manpower wasn't sufficiently large to police any given country or city in detail. So what they would want to do would be to slip themselves into a sort of command position over collaborators within the indigenous police forces. The Nazis even named Chief Constable J.E. Horwell as a potential collaborator. While we can never know if this individual would have cooperated, this was exactly the strategy employed by the Nazis all over occupied Europe. They persuade people to acquiesce to this by appealing to their sense of duty uh, and, and that's quite an easy thing to do because that's what people are used to. You say, well you were the policeman before, we still need people to uh, prevent crime from taking place. Crime is still going to take place. Forget the fact that we are the Nazis, we're the Germans, we're you know, Mr. Hitler's horrible uh, invaders we still need you to do that job and you'll be helping your people by doing that job. And it would have worked in Britain just as it had in the Channel Islands as this extraordinary footage demonstrates. They weren't traitors or anything like that but, but the German orders came through and, and it was a matter of the king's dead, long live the king. They had to just carry out orders. In fact they arrested two or three policemen that refused to carry out some orders and they, they put them in the local prison. But they had no choice, they'd have lost their job, their pension, and most would have ended up in the camp with their families. With the police force at their disposal, the Nazis could expand their persecution of the British public, from the individuals named in the Black Book to entire sectors of society. Informations Hef GB devotes an entire chapter to universities and enemy cultural institutions. So how would the Nazis have treated these distinguished seats of learning? The Nazis would have um, regarded, rightly or wrongly, um, the universities in every country as sources of potential intelligent opposition. They would have sacked and replaced those academics who were very visible opponents of Nazism in general. In case of the libraries and so forth, they would have done presumably what they did themselves in May 1933 back in Germany, which is to um, sift through them and take out what they perceived to be subversive or degenerate books and make a bonfire of them in the Oxford quads. December 12th, 1940. Oxford University is purged by the SS. Over 20,000 books are burnt outside the Bodleian Library and 17 academics arrested. Among them is philosopher Bertrand Russell, who is killed as he struggles to put out the flames. The Germans' interest in the British educational system even extended to the major English boarding schools. The Nazis were um, uh, fascinated by the British elite education system, so public schools like Eton or Harrow or Winchester, and I think it's largely a reflection of their sense of inferiority. In other words, you know, this is, this is the system that made the British a gigantic imperial power when we had no empire ourselves. And uh, that's why I think in their occupation handbook they're so fascinated by the major public schools. I mean, Schellenberg actually notes the fact that Eton is fully booked up till 1949, so perhaps they were thinking of sending their own kids there. England is the country of Freemasonry. What concerns us is that in its ideological orientation it is a dangerous weapon in the hands of Britain's plutocrats against national socialist Germany. Informations Heft GB names more than 2,000 Freemasons lodges across the United Kingdom. Despite the Masons' reputation for secrecy, they were accurately categorized and cross-referenced, and even included specialist university and military lodges. With these detailed lists, 
British Freemasonry would have been eradicated, just as it was in the Channel Islands. It was on the morning of the 27th of January, 1941, that squads of special troops, professional wreckers, arrived here at the Masonic Temple in St. Helier and set about the systematic looting and pillaging of this beautiful building. They stripped out all the main furnishings and they also stripped out and ransacked the splendid library and museum. And as photographs which are taken at the Liberation Show, the damage inflicted was horrendous. It was state vandalism. Well, in the French case, they organized a huge exhibition in Paris on um, the evils of Freemasonry as a conspiracy. And likewise, in Britain, they would have barged into big Masonic lodges and confiscated all the paraphernalia. They might well have made a big exhibition of all this stuff in the Guildhall with all sorts of photographs and information and line charts showing this great Masonic network allegedly running Britain and pointing out how many cabinet ministers or whatever were Masons. And um, they would have tried to sell that to the population, saying, look here, you idiots, you've been um, governed for years by... 200 sort of leading Freemasons or something. December 15th. Freemasonry is declared illegal in Britain. The Grand Lodge is ransacked and 80 high-ranking Freemasons are deported to concentration camps, while the Young Men's Christian Association is permanently disbanded. The YMCA is described in Informations Heft GB as being entirely in the hands of the Freemasons. Other groups which the Nazis perceived to be a threat included the Church of England and the Salvation Army. Informations Heft GB also targeted communists and trades unions and lists around 2,000 individual associations in Great Britain, even including groups as obscure as the Rossendale Union of Boot and Shoemakers. While all these groups would be banned and their leaders arrested, there was one minority who would be singled out above all others. Cromwell was convinced his people were the chosen ones, just as the Jews were. This set the foundations for an Anglo-Jewish alliance. There is no exact estimate of the number of Jews living in England. Officially, there are said to be 300,000, but in reality, the number is significantly higher. Along with Schellenberg's vision of an Anglo-Jewish alliance, Informations FGB contains the names of thousands of Jewish organizations and individuals living in Britain. The Nazis would use this information to enact the final solution, which they envisaged for the whole of Europe. Anti-Semitism was at the core of Nazism. Uh, essentially in the 1930s in Germany, their policy was to force the, Jewish, the Jews in Germany to emigrate. When it comes to the policy towards Jews in specific occupied countries, uh, they had to tread quite carefully here because a lot of the Jewish populations were extremely assimilated. So they would pick the least line of resistance in other words, they would go after recent Jewish immigrants, mainly, mainly people fleeing German persecution, as it happens, in Central and Eastern Europe, um, who on the whole would be less missed than the people who were highly assimilated and your next-door neighbours. Thousands of Jews had fled from Germany to Britain in the 1930s. These émigrés were specifically targeted in Informations FGB, which even included photographs of the 30 most wanted refugees. They were to be terminated immediately. This would have been made easier by the fact that many of them had already been interned by the British. It was quite hard for a lot of people to distinguish between somebody being German or Austrian and somebody being Jewish and fleeing from Nazi persecution. Churchill famously said, collar the lot, put them all away. It doesn't really matter if most of them are innocent, but we're so worried about the few that might not be that we want to get them all into camps. We were put into a row of about 60 houses who had previously been boarding houses. There were fences, barbed wire fences, and there stood every 50 yards a soldier with rifle and bayonet. We were horrified that this happened to us. Um, many people could never understand it. My wife, uh, 
to her, to the end of her days, um, felt hurt, felt deeply offended. The Jewish refugees who were interned, I think, did feel particularly vulnerable um, because if an invasion had taken place, the fact that they'd already been rounded up and put in camps um, would have made them, it would have been very easy for Hitler to have, the, the Nazis to have found out exactly where they were and they would have had few chances to escape. The Germans would probably have differentiated very much between refugees and British Jews. German refugees would have been dead inside four weeks. December 14th, the 20,000 foreign Jews interned on the Isle of Man are deported to concentration camps in Eastern Europe. The official line is that they're being repatriated, but unknown to the British public, they will never leave these camps alive. Once the Jewish emigres had been eliminated, the Nazis would follow the pattern they established in Europe and turn their attention to Britain's indigenous Jewish population. The Nazi occupiers were extremely clever in all the countries that they went to. They didn't march in saying we are about to take away the Jewish population and kill them. They tended to make it a several stage process. They'd isolate the Jews, they'd get them all together in one place first, so they'd remove them from their non-Jewish friends and neighbours, so it was harder to actually then know what was going on. They'd always say the next stage is alright, you're going to be sent to work somewhere, you're going to be sent to, to, to do something else. It's not we're going to take you away and kill you. So there, were always, there was always that modicum of hope, maybe we can believe them, maybe we are just being sent to a work camp. First thing that they, the Nazis would do would be to identify the Jewish population. So shops would actually be physically identified that they were Jewish owned. Part of the process of um, identifying the Jewish population would be to compel them to wear stars of David sewn onto their clothing and that happened in every other country. And um, I see no reason why it wouldn't have been done in Britain too. January 15, 1941. The first anti-Jewish legislation is enacted in Britain. Jewish businesses and individuals are identified by stars and Jews are banned from the professions. By February, Jews are required to hand over their businesses to non-Jews and thousands are deprived of their livelihood. The next stage after that um, would be to physically concentrate the Jewish population. So I could foresee a situation where Jews living in North London and Hampstead or Hendon or Stamford Hill would be physically relocated down to the east end of London, say Stepney. March 12th, the Stepney Ghetto is established in the east end of London. The Jewish populations of Liverpool, Manchester and Leeds are forcibly relocated to the capital. Almost 200,000 people are compelled to live in an area less than a mile square. By April, massive overcrowding and lack of adequate sanitation causes an outbreak of cholera and the Nazi authorities order the area to be sealed off. As a Jewish person, you'll find yourself subjected to ever tighter restrictions, which, in a way, the effect of that will be that it will cut all the bonds of sociability to other people around you, and then eventually you'll find yourself spirited away, probably in the night. In the British case, they would pick a large building with good transport links, which, like Olympia, for example, where you could put large numbers of people and then spirit them away by train down to Southampton to take them by ship over to the continent. England has some of the largest museums in the world. Art treasures and cultural valuables have been collected or stolen for decades. They also contain documents and works of art in which the German Reich must have a special interest. Informationshef GB then lists the names and addresses of numerous museums all over Britain. But why would the Nazi occupiers need this detailed information? Hitler planned to establish in Linz, which was his hometown in Austria, uh, the artistic centerpiece of the world. Um, it was to feature a massive art gallery um, and museum, opera houses, theatres, even a, a large cinema.
and the Museum and Art Gallery were to be collectively known as the Führer Museum and these were to be the home of the greatest works of art throughout the world. It's almost certain that Hitler would have stripped the National Gallery, the British Museum and our other major museums and galleries completely. He would have just taken everything. Everything would have been transferred to Germany where it would have been, he would have selected the items for Linz and the rest probably would have been distributed amongst German museums throughout Germany. The entire looting operation was called Sonderauftrag Linz, Special Operation Linz. And planning for it began way before the Second World War. Um, and you had Hitler's art, adv art advisors had over a period of time they had collected massive dossiers on collections of works of art and individual works of art that were to be targeted, that they were to be lifted once German troops had gone into the country's concern. It was entirely self-contained. Squads of ERR troops would seal off areas. ERR packers would move in with carpenters and uh, and transport personnel and they would physically remove them to uh, an ERR repository. In addition to paintings rather, also the Nazis confiscated large collections of other types of treasure which included arms and armor, coins, jewelry, furniture and complete libraries of books. Don't forget Hitler's overriding aim was to establish Linz as the artistic centerpiece of the world and therefore anything of major value in this country would have gone to Linz. May 12th, art from all over Europe is exhibited in Germany. Hitler calls it the greatest exhibition of its kind in the world. Greek statues from the British Museum are the sculptural highlights. But in fact the event is an elaborate deception to distract Hitler's communist allies. Two days later, he launches Operation Barbarossa, and the Nazi war machine attacks the Soviet Union. Hitler had always planned to attack Russia in May, but historically the assault was delayed until June 22nd. This was because the British opened up a second front in Greece, and Hitler had to divert his armies to fight in the Balkans, which put back his attack on Russia by almost six weeks. The conquest of Britain would have had a major impact on the, con the wider conduct of the war, because First of all, um, Hitler would not have had to have uh, diverted part of his forces into the Balkans and Greece to stiffen up Italian military operations down there. So in other words, he would have been able to launch Operation Barbarossa on schedule you know, earlier than the 22nd of June 1941. That in turn would have meant that they could have swept towards Moscow and Leningrad without the um, encumbrances of the onset of autumnal rains and um, let alone the winter. And given that the Soviet Union just literally fell apart, they would have um, conquered it. September 1st, 1941. Germany wins the war in the east. With the fall of Moscow after just six weeks, it was only a matter of time before the Soviets surrendered. And Adolf Hitler now has the whole of continental Europe at his feet. The Nazi empire now stretches from the Atlantic to the Urals. And there's only one obstacle left between Hitler and total world domination. America. If the Nazis failed to cut a deal with the Americans, they um, were already working on the big technology to take America on. I mean, for example, they had were developing bombers which could cross the Atlantic, large bombers. They were building ever greater sized battleships, you know, to go out and fight on the ocean waves. And um, having got to Britain, of course, they would have um, had the uh, prize of getting their hands on uh, scientific work on nuclear bombs and, and a big sort of science, intelligent science base, which they could blend with their own. Werner Heisenberg had been working on producing a Nazi nuclear bomb since the 30s. If Britain had fallen, he would have had additional resources and might successfully have engineered a bomb before the Americans completed the Manhattan Project. 
we might well have had a nuclear war because after all the Americans would have been working on similar big industrial atomic technology so you might have had a nuclear war between you know German dominated Europe and the United States <laughs> December 25th, 1944. Siberia, and the Nazis test the first nuclear bomb. America says it has a similar weapon and calls for an end to the war. I suppose you could imagine um, in the 1950s and 60s, as Robert Harris did in his wonderful book Fatherland, a sort of cold war between America and um, a Nazi-dominated Europe. In addition to nuclear weapons, the Nazis developed the world's first rocket technology. The V-1 and V-2s they developed were actually the forerunners of both nuclear missiles and even space rockets. The man in charge of the operation was Werner von Braun. Historically, he was captured by the Americans at the end of the war and ended up as the Nassau chief who put men on the moon. If Hitler had won, he would still have been working for the Germans. It's not inconceivable that, um, you know, people of our age would have grown up with um, a Nazi rocket and Germans being the first on the moon. In the summer of 1940, history hung in the balance. Hitler's armies had conquered Poland, Norway, Holland, and Belgium in quick succession. Next, the Nazi blitzkrieg overwhelmed France, and the British army were forced to retreat from Dunkirk. Now Adolf Hitler stood, just as Napoleon had stood, more than 100 years before, and looked across the English Channel to the one fighting obstacle that stood between him and world domination, a tiny island, Great Britain. The preliminaries were over. It was time for the main event. July 16th, 1940. Adolf Hitler issued Directive 16, the order to prepare an invasion of Great Britain. I have decided to prepare a landing operation against England and, if necessary, to carry it out. The aim of this operation will be to eliminate the English homeland as a base for the prosecution of the war against Germany and, if necessary, to occupy it completely. In England, Prime Minister Winston Churchill was preparing Britain to resist the Nazi invasion. Churchill ordered the creation of the biggest and best organized resistance network the world had ever seen. Thousands of ordinary civilians were trained in the art of sabotage and guerrilla warfare. But the role of the auxiliary units has never been fully revealed because they never had to go into action in 1940. In this film, we tell the full story of these men and women for the first time and find out how Churchill's secret army would have fared if the Nazis had invaded England in the summer of 1940. Welcome to Hitler's Britain. In June 1940, as the Nazi war machine prepared to crush Great Britain, Winston Churchill vowed to defend the nation from invasion by any means necessary. While the regular forces and the Home Guard were training to repulse the Germans using traditional warfare, Winston Churchill had ordered the creation of a secret resistance network known only as the Auxiliary Units. The thing about the Auxiliaries, to my mind, was the fact that in spite of all these wonderful tales of the war, and there's been plenty of them, and uh, when it comes to the RAF and the Navy and Rommel and all that sort of thing, the auxiliary units have never really been revealed to the public. It didn't occur to me to tell anybody because it was endangering my life. The less people that knew about it, the better. The role of the auxiliary units was never fully revealed. Now, after more than 50 years of silence, their story can be told for the first time. Well, I had to sign the Official Secrets Act about 1940. Well, I didn't speak to anybody about it until, I suppose, late 1990s. People now have no idea. I, I mean, I couldn't even explain to my own sons what it was like. More than 5,000 auxiliary units were recruited from villages all over Britain in the summer of 1940. 
He said, uh, I, I must warn you that uh, your life expectancy when the Germans arrive here will be about 15 days, if you're lucky. Well, looking back on it, I think, gosh, you know, how on earth could we do it? But uh, it was war, and there was the nasty prospect of becoming part of Germany, and we, whatever else we did, we didn't want to do that. In this film, we piece together the testimony of the surviving members of Churchill's secret army to find out what would have happened in a typical English village if the Nazis had invaded. We'll call our village Hayford and imagine it is somewhere in Sussex. The story of this village would have been played out all over the country if the Nazis had invaded Britain in 1940. September 24, 1940. The German army have successfully landed on the coast of southern England. They've established a beachhead and are advancing on London. As the British fall back, they leave behind a secret army of saboteurs trained to harass the Germans from behind enemy lines. This is the village of Hayford, 60 miles behind the front line in territory occupied by the Nazis. A small detachment of reserve troops from the German army have been assigned to the village to secure the nearby railway line and airfield. What the German soldiers don't know is that in hundreds of typical English villages like Hayford, what looked like a normal congregation actually included spies, demolitions experts, assassins and secret radio operators just waiting for the Germans to arrive. They are all part of Churchill's secret army the auxiliary units. He restores my soul. He leads me. The Germans are coming! As the Nazi soldiers arrive in Hayford, a group of local farmers and gamekeepers go into action. They instantly move to the nearby woods, where they have a secret underground base. Here they have an arsenal of weapons and explosives, which they will use to harass the German forces in a series of daring nighttime raids. They will survive for less than a week. Meanwhile, in Hayford, as the German troops drive into the village, they are being watched. The seemingly scared citizens have actually been trained to remember the number of soldiers that pass, to recognize the German vehicles, and to identify high-ranking officers. This information will be passed on to the man at the center of the local spy ring. British military intelligence have equipped the vicar with a secret radio hidden under his altar. Using this device, he is able to communicate the German troop movements back to British Army Command. The information he sends should give the British a crucial advantage when the time comes to launch a counterattack. Ezekiel calling base. This may seem like a flight of fancy, but this is exactly what Churchill had planned to happen in villages all over Britain. It is a fact. The auxiliary units were the only in situ resistance organization in place in Europe before the arrival of the Germans. Although the Poles built up a massive resistance organization under German occupation, as did the French, none of those countries, neither the Low Countries nor Norway, had an in situ, ready to operate guerrilla army, civilian or otherwise, as we did in this country. In the summer of 1940, hundreds of typical English villages like Hayford were home to members of Churchill's secret army. The auxiliary units were made up of two distinct groups, and the first to go into action would have been the special duties section. Well, we were apparently very innocent people. I mean, my father was a busy doctor going around visiting his patients, and um, I was just a brat riding horses. I was myself, a gardener, a carpenter, an Aberystwyth graduate, a doctor, and the three vicars. Dad in particular as a doctor would be intelligence gathering. The group would have to, uh, well, spy really on everything that was taking place in that area. 
George Vater and Jill Monk were some of the 4,000 civilians asked by British military intelligence to gather information on the German forces once they invaded Britain. Jill's father was one of the first men to join the network. My father evidently got recruited for this job. We didn't know anything about it to start with until the army turned up and fixed a radio transmitter and receiver under the floor of our so-called air raid shelter. Well, this used to be the billiard room. We had a mat here, and you took the mat away, and you lift it up, and down you go to the cellar, where we had our secret. And you could put the lid down behind you, and somebody could put the mat over the top behind you, and nobody knew you were there. And then into the cellar here, it was done up as an air raid shelter, and that's the end where the sect was hidden, in the old coal chute. And in front of it was a board fitted over with an electric stove attached, and in the side here was a little catch, and you had to have a very thin knife to press down the catch, lift out the stove, and in here was the receiver and transmitter, and up here the messages were let, sent down in a tennis ball from the yard. We collected them down here. And then they were coded up and sent through on this set. And after transmission, back went the stove, and nobody knew it was there. Almost 200 radio sets were hidden around Britain, and they were supplied with information by more than 4,000 runners, all of whom were trained to use ingenious dead letter drops. We have some examples of dead letter drops favoured by the special duty section of the auxiliaries. This door knocker apparently uh, actually hid a hidden removable section into which could be fed a short message from the runner for conveyance to the radio station. This gate hinge was another one that was favoured, but it was a false gate hinge, cut in the middle, capable of taking a short message to fit in here. For collection by the runner. And finally, and quite frequently used, was this device for placing in a telegraph pole. The idea of this pin was that the plate gave the number to identify the telegraph pole. But in fact, it was a false fixture, which once again allowed the hidden message to be slotted into a cutaway portion. And it was useful to the runner himself because if the number was the right way up, there was no message in there. If it was the wrong way up, it contained a message. So there was an exterior reference for the runner to see whether there was room to post another letter or not. George Vater's recollections of his duties are the basis for the radio network in the fictional village of Hayford. There was a dead letter drop, which was a loose stone and that was a letterbox that the Reverend Evans had to clear. In my case, I had to take it to the radio operator, whatever message it was. I was the last man on the line and had to get through to the radio. And you took the message out and then read it, destroyed it because you had to remember it and carry it in your mind rather than on paper. So in a village like Hayford, the local vicar would have been at the center of a secret radio network. We would have a radio set which would transmit. It would be in the hands of the Reverend Sluman. And I later found that the radio set was under the altar in Lantillo Church. Ezekiel calling base. I do know that our radio operator had to radio that back to a substation, and that station contacted the Western Command. No one in the network knew anyone else as a general rule. But the most important thing was that they were a part of the Secret Intelligence Service, and the Secret Intelligence Service requires its operators to remain secret forever. It's hard to believe what it was like. 
I can't believe it myself now. I think it was perhaps part of it was a dream. I don't know. <laughs> it it was very hard to believe. We were told that um, if we were caught, we would be treated as spies, and presumably we were liable to be put up against a wall and shot. October 16th, fierce fighting continues in Kent, but panzer divisions of the 16th Army have broken through the British defences and are advancing towards Southampton. German morale is high and Blitzkrieg seems unstoppable. In the village of Hayford, the Nazis are following the pattern of occupation which they established in Europe and they issue a proclamation to the people of England. This document was actually written by Field Marshal Walter von Prauschitz in July 1940, when Hitler named him as Commander-in-Chief of the Nazi invasion force. Von Prauschitz hoped this document would discourage resistance. Troops will respect property and persons if the population behaves according to instructions. All thoughtless actions, sabotage of any kind, and any passive or active opposition to the German armed forces will incur the severest retaliatory measures. I warn all civilians that if they undertake active operations against the German forces, they will be condemned to death. What the Nazis don't know is that just as in dozens of other villages across Britain, in the woods near Hayford, there is a group of villagers who are preparing to launch a series of attacks from a secret underground base. The guts of the auxiliary units are the operational patrols without any doubt. The civilian men of the operational patrols were never to be in contact in any way with army command once the Germans had taken over. They were to be isolated to make their own decisions and to survive until counter-attack or death. The brief was that when we got the message the balloon has gone up, we had to go into the OB and live there and stay there until the Germans appeared in our area uh, when we had to uh, attack them. We were, in the case of an invasion of course, to go to ground. We would have a large supply of uh, dangerous weapons and explosives and we hope to stab them in the back and blow up odd bits and pieces and generally uh, be a darn nuisance to the invaders. Jeff Bowery was one of the first men recruited into the auxiliary units. It was part of his job to design the extraordinary bunkers which the auxiliaries were provided with as bases. And you'll notice in front of me an absolutely queer contraption. And this was the entrance to an object called an OB, or operational base. And this is from where the auxiliary unit member would work when he was trying to do damage to the Germans. At the bottom, there is a passage that goes along and into a room which was built underground. This is not quite as the lid used to be years ago. The whole thing was made completely level with the ground and it was covered with the natural leaves and things that are happening in this wood at the moment. So it was almost invisible unless you knew where to go and find it. Just in the ground in one corner coming up was a little wire with a tiny piece that you could put your finger in and pull and it would release a catch and the door would then swing open quite automatically like that. After you got down into the ladder, down into below, you could pull the door back into position and we hoped that no one around could see that anything had happened at all. This is one of the last surviving operational bases in Britain. Although more than 500 of these were built close to villages all over the country in 1940, most have now collapsed since being forgotten at the end of the war. This was the main room of the actual OB and could have housed up to four or five men. It's about 60 years ago since I partook in anything like this. And I was very surprised when I came here to find that this one was still in the condition that it's in. 
I must say that this one in particular was far better built than the average ones. They were simply holes in the ground which were locked. This is known as an escape tunnel and it was not really as big as this in the first place. It was usually about one meter high by about one meter wide and it enabled you to roll and scratch your way through out of the place and at the other end there was an, another concealed trap door which lets you out into the a ditch or the open countryside. The auxiliary units were organized in a cellular structure. Each group of four to six men would only operate in an area within 15 miles of their base and they would have no knowledge of the other units in nearby villages. There are four men in the Hayford Auxiliary Patrol. They will stay in this bunker until the German army is defeated or they are killed. The tactics the men will employ were developed by Major Colin Gubbins, the man that Winston Churchill had chosen to lead the auxiliary units. Major Gubbins had won the military cross in the First World War and had then served in Ireland, where he became an expert in guerrilla warfare. The regular army did not approve of his methods, as they were considered dishonorable, but once Churchill had decided that stay-behind forces were essential to the defense of Britain, Gubbins was the only man for the job. In the summer of 1940, Major Gubbins began to assemble the secret army that would be devoted to attacking the Germans from behind. Although he was planning violent guerrilla warfare, Gubbins insisted that his methods were known quaintly as scallywagging. The men were recruited from members of the Home Guard, and Gubbins, along with 12 hand-picked intelligence officers, began the recruitment drive for the best men in Britain. Now those men were specifically chosen uh, because of their resourcefulness, because of their ability to keep a secret, their ability to live off the land, and their ability to work with one another, and to pick up the rudimentaries of firearms and explosives training and quickly to become experts. In July 1940, 17-year-old Jeff Devereaux was called from the factory where he worked and told to report to a mysterious man who was waiting outside for him in an unmarked car. He said, uh, Mr. Churchill's convinced that uh, this country will be invaded very soon. And uh, so we, he's uh, set up a, an organization to deal with the Germans when they get here. And you're very, you've been very highly recommended to me as a possible leader of this. And uh, you're the first person I've, uh, I've tackled about it. Are you interested? I was far too terrified to say no, of course. <laughs> and so I said yes. Like all auxiliaries, Jeff was told to report to the innocuous village of Highworth in Wiltshire. It was here that he met Mabel Stranks, who was to become a legendary figure amongst the auxiliary units. More than three and a half thousand people reported to this woman in 1940, but the postmistress was just a cover for the extraordinary training operation taking place in nearby Coles Hill House. There's another one here. Well, I arrived at the post office in Highworth and uh, I knew I had been instructed. There was one of the few instructions that I'd got and I had to learn it and not write it sort of thing. And I had to go in there and say to this funny little uh, postmistress there that uh, I wanted to go to Coles Hill House. A car or van or something came up and it conducted me down this side road to Coles Hill House where I came across this wonderful place. It was here that the auxiliary units were trained in the art of guerrilla warfare, sabotage, and assassination. Thousands of auxiliary units were recruited in 1940, and all of them had to report to Coles Hill House. The main residence has since burnt down, but many outbuildings survive on the secluded estate. It was here that the auxiliaries were trained in the latest techniques of unconventional warfare. In spite of all the different weapons that we were issued with, like pistols and hand grenades and all those noisy things, one of the most effective, I should have thought, would have been this knife. And it was a special knife designed and used by we people in the auxiliary units. 
A little bit about it, you'll notice that it was very cleverly made with a kind of a triangular, if you can call it that, blade. And this was supposed to go into a, an enemy's body and come out making as little noise and confusion as possible. Their particular targets were, of course, railway lines. Always a good uh, target for, uh, to prevent the movement of enemy supplies and enemy troops. They were aircraft. They were tanks as a last resort and they were enemy transport, enemy troops, enemy fuel depots and food depots. Anything that could be traced during re reconnaissance by day for disposal by night. Seventeenth October, the British Army launch a disastrous counter-attack outside Maidstone in Kent. The 300 tanks at their disposal are no match for the German panzers, while heavy artillery batters the English infantry. After three days of fighting, Maidstone is reduced to rubble. 15,000 Englishmen are killed, and 40,000 are taken prisoner, while what remains of the British Army retreat to London. Nazi generals must wait for supplies and reinforcements by rail before they can advance further. In order to safeguard their lines of supply, the reserve detachment of the German army are guarding the railway station three miles outside Hayford village. For the local auxiliary units, the sentries are a prime target. If we went into a camp at night, we were supposed to silently kill the sentries and then blow up the fuel dumps or anything else what was there. But uh, we weren't supposed to take on the, uh, on the Germans. We were supposed to get in and get out again. The Hayford auxiliaries know that if they can take out the sentries, it will demoralize the Germans and divert important troops away from the front line. It's a risky operation for men armed with knives, but the auxiliaries were confident in their abilities. I think the odds were much more in our favor than the officials realized because of the fact that we were working on our own patch. We knew the ground, we knew the people, we had practiced uh, stalking farmers doing their rounds at night and not being seen and uh, and the odd farmer tread on your hand and things like that in the dark, you know. So that we thought we could had a good chance of getting to grips with, uh, with the problem. Our officers told us that if we kill one of these sentries, not, not just to stick our knife into him, but we've got to cut his stomach open and lay his intestines in a nice little pile <laughs> at the side, so it was when they saw him, when they, and they saw him, it had upset all the rest of them. <laughs> While the auxiliaries were expected to use these knives for silent attacks, they were just the first weapons in what became an extremely extensive and unconventional arsenal. This bizarre collection of weapons were all issued to auxiliaries at one time or another. Although some were very basic, others were at the cutting edge of military technology, being developed under Churchill's orders. There was an organization being created called Winston Churchill's Toy Shop, and they were the organization that were creating a number of gadgets and booby traps that were to be used by the auxiliary units and, and irregular forces throughout the rest of the war. All these fancy things that came along, for some reason, Mr. Churchill and his mob, his war office, would pass them on to us to try beforehand, like hand grenades, explosives, time pencils, pressure switches, booby trap lines. If we had detonators, four explosives and pull switches, anti-tank bombs and um, incendiary bombs, smoke bombs. The army delivered it and it was put in the garage and the garage was locked up. And there was a, at one stage there was a hundred pounds of uh, Semtex in the wooden garage next to the cottage. You know? <laughs> there was enough explosive to demolish a, a major river bridge or a hundred tanks. I said, uh, it would be as well if you didn't smoke anywhere near the garage, Bob. <laughs> By mid-October, it's four weeks since the Germans first landed. Until now, the British Army have been out of range of ground attack aircraft flying from France. But with the capture of airfields in the southeast of England, the Luftwaffe begin to relentlessly pound British troops, transport and supply lines. 
Without any air cover to defend them, the British Army are sitting ducks. Pelham Airfield is 10 miles outside Hayford. It is now being used by the Germans to fly sorties against the British. On their second night of operations, it is up to the Hayford auxiliaries to put the airfield out of action. I would do a recce to have a look to see uh, exactly where they were and how to get to them and so on. I'd go back and we'd make a plan and we'd uh, put together our charges of, uh, of Semtex and then uh, we'd go as a group to deal with them. You had to take the thing readily made up and it had to be completely made up with the time pencil inserted into the charge with the fuse and everything on the only thing between your life and your death for that matter was the little safety pin in it you see we were told how to make a plane so that people wouldn't want to fly it by uh, putting a bit of plastic on the tail nothing pleased me more than night attacks we knew full well through much practice that we could do it, and you can do anything with much practice, you know. An ordinary human being cannot sit and wait and watch for long. Soldiers on guard duty, they're clanking the butt of their rifle on the ground every now and then, and sort of give away signs of the trouble, you see. But once you can come to a unit like that, you knew you were on the right spot, of course, and uh, you could work out a plan. You could find the weak spots. After silently removing the German sentries, the auxiliaries are able to place charges of explosives on planes and fuel tanks. With this act, the handful of men from Hayford have struck a valuable blow against the Germans and have seriously damaged the Luftwaffe's ability to prosecute war from the air. The following day, the Germans count the cost of the attack. Twelve planes destroyed and three men killed in a scene repeated across airfields in the southeast of England. The local Nazi commander orders his men to take action against the saboteurs. After two nights of activity, the Hayford auxiliaries know that the Germans are now actively trying to track them down. They must take drastic measures to ensure that their operations are not compromised. Well, part of the equipment we were given was an envelope. Uh, which uh, said on the outside, only to be opened when the Germans arrive on your patch. There were two things that were only to be opened when the Germans arrived on the patch. One was this envelope, and the other was the gallon bottle of rum that we were provided with. I never opened mine, but uh, I've heard that uh, somebody did open theirs, and uh, the the letter was an instruction to eliminate certain people on their patch. Like all auxiliaries, the men of Hayford were vetted by the local police chief before being recruited. As this man knows who they are, he could reveal their identities to the Germans. There is only one way for the auxiliaries to ensure they are not exposed, and the men were provided with a dedicated weapon for this task. We had a special issue of one only, a 2-2, a .22 sniping rifle. And this had a telescopic sight and it was one of the most beautiful weapons I've ever handled in my life. The fellow who opened this envelope discovered to his horror that one of the things he had to do immediately was to eliminate the chief constable. If he knew of your position and 
you knew he'd been talking about it, he would be a war casualty. Our instruction was to remove them. As simple as that. But would these men really have taken the lives of a fellow Englishman simply on these instructions? Yes, well, uh, if the, the balloon had gone up and the Germans had invaded, and I'd opened my envelope, I would have done what they, the letter instructed me to do. I, I have no doubt about that. October 19th, Luftwaffe chief Hermann Goering orders a massive air raid on central London. Winston Churchill is killed by a direct hit on the cabinet war rooms and the historic center of the capital lies in ruins. Even Buckingham Palace is hit and as the nation mourns, the royal family are evacuated to Canada. What's left of the government flee to Worcester with the remnants of the army, but the British public are losing their appetite for war. Just as in occupied Europe, once the front line has moved on and the Germans seem to be winning, there would always be people who would attempt to better their own situation. If they had invaded, one or two folks we thought we might squeal on or anything like that, uh, our job was supposed to eliminate them. With the tide of the war turning in favor of the Germans, there are people in the village of Hayford who have begun to fraternize with the Nazis. With the shortages caused by the war, talking to a German officer seems like a small price to pay for a cigarette. But for the Hayford Auxiliaries, even this small act is collaboration with the enemy. The opportunity to remove a German officer and a traitor cannot be ignored. If someone you know is a traitor, they aren't on your side, are they? So annihilation is on the cards. There's no two ways about it. We had to be extremely hard in our outlook. The men of Hayford have been operational for less than a week but already they are running low on supplies. Like all auxiliaries, they were given very few rations, as they were never expected to be operational for more than two weeks. After a series of successful attacks on German positions and the assassination of a Nazi officer, the men of Hayford know that their days are numbered. October 20th, after the assassination of a senior officer in Hayford, the local Nazi commandant decrees that there will be reprisals for the recent guerrilla activity. He orders a specialist anti-partisan unit of the Waffen-SS to find the perpetrators and take revenge. Their suspicions focus on the woods surrounding Hayford, and the manhunt begins. I think in the end the Germans would have sort of discovered that things were happening, you see, and why was this happening and why was that happening, you see, and, and, and probably we'd have all got it in the end. I was terrified that the Germans would use dogs to track us down and find our OB. If they find it, they drop a grenade down there and kill us all. Tunnels, two foot six square, with 
corrugated iron and wooden support, you know. And they, those entrances were also uh, came up in the middle of bushes and were very beautifully camouflaged. Well, it's hard to say what would have happened. We wouldn't have been killed off, I don't think, right away. We would have been grilled and questioned because they were always after information. They would say, ah, what are these English troops doing here, sort of thing. The last surviving man of the Hayford Auxiliary units may have escaped the bunker, but he knows he cannot outrun the German soldiers. With little ammunition, he must take drastic measures to avoid capture. Like all auxiliaries, he has been briefed as to what he should do. If any of us had been caught, one thing we weren't supposed to surrender. We were supposed to use the last round to finish ourselves off. But no matter how determined the auxiliary units were to avoid capture, the Germans would not be satisfied, even with their death. Nazi policy demanded reprisals. In occupied Europe, where there was partisan or resistance activity, the German policy was to go to the nearest village and shoot numbers of people by way of reprisal. So if a German soldier got knifed in the night or dumped in a canal, they would just go to the nearest place and shoot 50 people. And there's no reason to assume they wouldn't have done that in Britain. While the murder of the local police chief provoked little reaction from the Germans, the assassination of the Nazi officer in Hayford village means that a brutal response is inevitable. In the event that resistance forces were so rash in a way as to assassinate a major figure, I mean, as in the case of Reinhard Heydrich in Czechoslovakia, um, the reprisals would be quite devastating on the places from which the assassins were alleged to have come or which were just proximate to the assassination uh, they would roll up and they would just um, kill most of the inhabitants and probably erase the place off the map so in a typical village like Hayford whilst the auxiliaries would have carried out their orders and the special duty section would have reported the results a tragedy would surely unfold in less than two weeks, the Hayford Auxiliary Units have been responsible for attacking a railway station, destroying an airfield, and assassinating a German officer. Although the men responsible have been killed, Nazi logic demanded that the entire village pay the price. An instance of massive reprisals in a West European context would be where some French um, resistors decided to shoot at a um, SS Panzer Division which was being taken, transferred from Russia to combat the Allies on the Normandy beaches. And uh, these people, for whom wiping out villages was an everyday life event, uh, shot the place to pieces. You can still go and see the ruins and put all the people in the church and murdered them, about 500 people. So if um, uh, somebody um, attack German forces you know, in a British context, you could quite easily foresee massive military reprisals leading to some dinky, picturesque um, Berkshire or Wiltshire village just being obliterated off the map with all its inhabitants. There's no doubt about it, if we'd made a good job one night and destroyed several and lives and tanks and various things like that, they would have gone to the nearest village and, it, and blown up everybody or something like that. Well, this was a worry that, you know, in the event of us being discovered, would they, you know, take revenge on the rest of the town?
We knew that we'd be in a fair amount of danger. Uh, and we just hoped we didn't get caught. The Hayford Auxiliary units might all be dead and the villagers massacred. But what about the other 5,000 auxiliaries hiding around Britain? Could they perhaps continue to fight a successful guerrilla war against the Nazis? They would have performed well in the short term. All the long-term evidence is that they didn't have sufficient backup of resources or reinforcements uh, to enable them to take part in a long-term campaign, as was conducted on the continent with SOE, in particular in France. The Special Operations Executive, or SOE, was organized by Major Gubbins, the man who created the auxiliary units. It was SOE that actually made resistance possible in France and Greece, with airdrops of radios, arms and ammunition. With England occupied, it was not just the British auxiliaries who could not be resupplied. It would mean the end of resistance all over Europe. November 1st, 1940. Six weeks after they landed, the triumphant German army parade through the streets of London. Without supplies or reinforcements and faced with brutal reprisals, the British public realize that further resistance is futile. The last beacon of freedom in Europe has been extinguished, and Hitler's victory is complete. Welcome to Hitler's Britain.